Okay, so let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for the study of the kings and the prophets. And, and uh, I'm really glad, Lord, that uh, we're getting to a place where we're almost to the end. And Father, I just praise you and I ask you, Lord, to just continue to teach us and show us clearly what you have for us in your word. I praise you, Father, and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, did I bring the wrong book? I did. <laughs> you did? I was reading the right one this morning, left it laying on by my bed, and brought brought eight of ten. <laughs> but it's That's supposed right. to be... What are what book are I mean? Is we it the are, ten of ten? Ten of ten. Okay, yeah. I brought the right book. No, I didn't. Right <laughs> away. Okay, so we're just going to talk about Deuteronomy twenty-eight to thirty. So, really, what are those three chapters telling us? What's what's Deuteronomy twenty-eight to thirty all really about? Blessings and curses. Okay, it's blessings and curses, and it's blessing. Obedience. Yeah. Meaning that you obey. <laughs> Curse. Disobey. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. That's what, that's basically what it is. As I started going through this, there were just certain words that really just stood out to me. So, uh, what is it that God, and it's kind of organized. Basically, verses of chapter 28, verses 1 through 14 are going to tell you that uh, Israel will receive blessings. And he's and that's what he's, he's saying to them. Uh, 28, 1 through 14 is God will bless. And it is God will bless if you do what? Obey. Okay. Diligently <laughs> obey his commands. Diligently obey. I mean, he didn't just say obey. You could sort of obey. Too. But if you're diligent, to obey. If you're diligent to obey, you will be blessed. So he starts giving this list. You've got to be, verse 1 and verse 2 says, Now it shall be, you diligently obey the Lord your God. Be careful to do all his commandments, which I command you today. The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. So, to when God is blessing you, then what's happening? What is the promise in you? What's he specifically saying he's going to do? It's going to set them high above all nations. Yes. You will be set high. And so, I mean, what would that be saying? Think about what that's saying. Why would he do that? They are, they are to be a light to the other nations. A light. An it's example. an example. So when you really think about it, what is, you know, we, we just said this before the class, America has always been the light. Yeah. The light. Yeah. The example. The, the goal for people to obtain. Yeah. This is what he wanted for Israel. For people to look at Israel and say, that is a nation that serves God. And their God is a powerful God because they're so mightily blessed. And then he gives these, these details of the blessing. Basis three, basically, 3 through 14 is you're blessed in the city, in the country, your offspring, your produce, your beasts, your food, your bread, that kind of stuff. So it is going to be kind of in uh, the land. You're going to be blessed in the land. You're going to be blessed with, uh, over your enemy. And 
and you're going to be blessed in your society, really, in the city, in the country, the offspring. Blessing over your enemies, blessing over the land, and blessed over your offspring or your uh, your society. Because you're not going to have all kinds of corruption and difficult things, right? And he keeps repeating. He's going to cause your enemies, verse 7, to be defeated. He's going to uh, bless you in the land that, you, that he's given you. He's going to establish you as a holy people. The Lord will make you, verse 11, abound in prosperity, in the offspring of your body, of your beasts, and the produce of your ground, which the Lord swore to your fathers. I mean, it is, it is good for us to obey him. What happens if they don't? <laughs> Verse 15 through 19 is basically saying what? If you don't obey, then you're going to be cursed. Yeah. It's going to bring these curses on you. Really, it's the rest of the chapter. 28, 15 through 60. Is it 68 is the last verse? 68. Yes, sixty-eight. Mm -hmm. First, now you know I don't want to spend make huge lists about this because I think there's a lot of repeated things going on, but the the fifteen through nineteen. Uh, of, of this chapter are the exact opposites of 1 through 14. He's saying 1 through 14 is you set up, bless, so on and so forth. 15 through 19, then you're, you're going to see all these curses and they're going to overtake you. Curse in the city, curse in the country, curse in your basket, meeting bowl, same thing. So 15 through 19 is telling you this is the opposite. Everything that you just saw that was here a blessing. Specifically in these things. Now why would God do that? Why not? Why be so specific in it? It's a contrasting and an, an emphasis in contrast to yeah. drive it home. Because it's you are being they're they're actually saying you're being diligent to disobey. In other words, this is something that really stood out to me, especially when we start talking about Ammon and Manasseh and all that. that. This is the opposite of blessing is choosing. To disobey. Yeah. Because the benefits of obedience are so great. I don't understand why we don't get that. I mean, this is a big problem. I think even in the church, like, why do we struggle with the concept of obedience when obedience brings blessing? Do you know what I mean? So, yes, obviously, yes. So it's the opposite of blessing. And then he says in verse 20, all the way down, really, verse 20, verse 22, verse 24, uh, 25, uh, uh, it, 31, until you are destroyed and you perish. That is, you will be uh, opposite of blessing, basically 20, 68 until you are destroyed. Man, that is sobering. I'm going to make sure you're destroyed and you perish. So, 
So then we get to this verse 63. And by the way, when you read this stuff, like 34, verse 34, this captivity, he's talking here, uh, and all of this really basically 20 through uh, on down to, I guess, gosh, um, to the end, really, uh, you will be driven mad by the sight of what you see. That is an incredible statement. We get to... Um, Verse 47, well, verse 45. So all these curses shall come upon you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed because you would not obey the Lord your God by keeping his commandments and statutes. Um, and verse 46, they shall become a sign and a wonder on you and your descendants forever. Verse 47, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy, ha, we didn't even talk about that, and a glad heart for the abundance of all things. Being blessed brings joy and abundance. I mean, that's an incredible thing. A glad heart. I think, uh, I, I mean, I have sort of recently in the last last couple of weeks, I've watched too much news and I was looking at my husband's like, there's no hope for this. I'm sure you know. There's no hope. I mean, it's 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 disheartening to see that. But, but the thing is, is that where is my joy? Where is my glad heart? You know, that's that's the thing. So you're going to serve your enemies. The Lord is going to send them against you. You're going to be hungry, thirsty, naked, lack of things, and iron yoke in your neck until he's destroyed you. Once again, you just go through it, just circle every time he says, said, destroy, oppress, and besiege. Boy, it is all over the place. So, and, and, and then we get to this horrible uh 56, 57, man, that was like, wow. Women eating their own afterbirth yeah. because they're starving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Verse 61. And also every sickness and every plague which, which was plague which not written in the book of this law, the Lord will bring on you until you are destroyed. So it's not just the plagues written, right? It's plagues that haven't even been written. Uh -huh. That's crazy. The diseases of Egypt and things that you haven't even heard of. And then verse 62, you will be left few in number, whereas you are numerous as the stars of heaven because you did not obey the Lord your God. Verse 63, I put the Hebrew translation of that word delight in here. And it means to rejoice, exalt, be glad, it is a verb that indicates great rejoicing and jubilant celebration. It refers to the Lord taking delight or joy over blessings, punishment, or discipline of his people. Now, there'd be some people that would be rather distressed by that statement. Why do you think God rejoices? I didn't expect that question. <laughs> he punishes his children and he's given them all of these blessings and he rejoices when they rejoice over his blessings. Right. But when they basically disobey, disobey and throw it back at you and you know, if you ever punished your kid and it felt good to <laughs> do that, I mean, I think, I think you didn't want to kill him, but it felt good. <laughs> so I think, I think a, a way to say that is that part of what's going on here is God loves them, yeah. which is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, and because He loves them, He is glad to do whatever it takes to get their attention. Right, and for Him, He's like. This is going to do it. Of course, they're still stubborn. This isn't it. Well, you know, there might be people, you know, there might be a hundred people and there might be one that, that gets it. Oh, yeah. Well, then, it, that's right. Now, I mean, that's what he's doing. I mean, the Lord. human number get it. Yeah. I think that's true. But he is, he okay. is. This is going to hurt. But he is. I yes. think that the better word to this because I love you. Uh -huh. is willing uh -huh. to do whatever it takes. God is willing to, and, and what does that say about his word? 
His word is true. true. It's true. Yeah, Paul's oh, word, yes. It will stand. Yeah. And no man is going to stand against that. No one will stand against that. That is a very important understanding of that word. He's going to make them few in number. And 65 to 68, this, this is the hardest, I think, when he says, you're going to have a trembling heart, failing eyes, despairing of soul. Your life shall hang in doubt before you, and you will be in dread night and day and have no assurance of your life. Because of the dread of your heart, which you dread, and for the sight of your eyes, which you will see. And he's saying, you know, I wish it was evening when it's morning. I wish it was morning when it was evening. Mm -hmm. That is going on right now. A member of our church, uh, his daughter was pistol whipped in her car. Mm -hmm. She was at an intersection and she did something that this guy didn't like. He got out of his car and she had a window down. And he just pistol whipped her. Right there. I mean, you know, some 30 year old girl was that around here. It was in Austin. Yeah. And uh, and so, and of course, his wife, um, you know, he he told me about it beginning at church a couple weeks ago. But he didn't want to tell her until after they had left because she would be very upset. And he had to be there so they, because he does technical stuff at the church. And so, you know, uh, there are people who won't go out at night anymore because they're afraid. This is a form of captivity that mm -hmm. we're experiencing in our in our city. We have uh, a gentleman that's Jewish, and uh, we don't you, you don't know. I mean, he's real. He's a good guy. His daughter's wonderful. She doesn't come as much as she used to. She used to come and uh, would bake for us, you know, and and we would all gather and and uh, uh, talk and I and I know this, this, she's not going, but once every mm -hmm. few months, and I think, or is she wary of it? I would be wary. I mean, you know the way things are. Yeah. Well, we're we're beginning to see the beginning of this. Mm -hmm. So, twenty nine Deuteronomy twenty nine. Uh, a lot of, I looked at, there's a couple of things I had to really look up and think about. 29.1, most commentators think it should be the last verse of Deuteronomy 28. Uh, because verse 2 is the summoning of all Israel to him. So, it's a, it's a he's re- issuing or restating the covenant that he had given them already in Exodus. This is what he's basically doing. So uh, these are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the sons of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he made with them at Horeb. So this is back. And he summons all Israel and said to them, you've seen that the Lord did what the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and all his servants and all his land. The great trials which you've seen, those great signs and wonders. Yet to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. This is very, very interesting. Because what is he actually saying to them? They're still disobedient. Right. Right. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out of you. Your sandals have not worn out on your foot. You've not eaten bread, nor have you drunk wine or strong drink, in order that you might know that I'm the Lord your God. But you still don't know, right? So he is, and, and we know that this is, they're standing before him because he says in verse 10, you stand today, all of you, before the Lord your God. And so the whole camp, everybody is there. That you may enter into the covenant which the Lord your God with your Lord your God and enter his oath which the Lord your God is making with you today. So he's formally giving them the law. That's what's happening in 29. Mm -hmm. In order that he may establish you today as his people, that he may be your God, just as he spoke to you as he swore to your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, not with you alone am I making this covenant and this oath. But both, this is important. This, this actually 
is the reason that the rest of kings and prophets could be studied the way it is. But both with those who stand here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God and with those who are not with us here today. He's saying, your descendants. This covenant isn't just with this group of people that came out of e Egypt. It is for everyone who's going to come through that bloodline. For you know how we lived in the land of Egypt and how we came through the midst of the nations through which you passed. You've seen their abominations, their idols of wood, stone, silver, and gold, which they have with them, so that there will not be among you a man or woman or family of pride whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to go serve God in those nations. So, you know, I mean, it's he re giving it to him. He's saying, you need to start paying attention to what I'm saying to you. I am establishing again. So 29, I, I don't have a whole lot of room. I'm just going to put 29. God is re-establishing the covenant with Israel. Now, just remember, 28, he's saying, Listen, you would be set high if you do what he's telling you to do in 29. If you are not going to be set high, you're going to be cursed. You're going to be destroyed. So 29 is telling us God has said all this in 28 so that he gets to 29. And then he starts saying, today, stand up. I'm giving you this information. This is what's going on here. And then what does he do again? But both those who stand here with us today in the presence of the Lord, and this is to your all generations. God's reestablishing, and it is to all generations. This is why all the other things that we have read uh, in parts one through eight can be done. Because he told them back in Deuteronomy, before they were in the promised land, you go into this land, you do what I tell you to do, you obey me, and you'll be blessed. And I'll take care of you because I love you. I want good for you. But if you do not, this isn't just you. It's not just the fathers. It's going to be every person who's from this bloodline is going to be subject to blessing or curse. Okay? That's what he's saying. So we see in 16 through 29, the curses as a result of disobedience. And one of the things that I thought was very uh, 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 amazing, verse 19, it shall be when he hears the words of this curse that he will boast. Who is he talking about? Any man or woman, family or tribe, whose heart turns away from God. That's what he's saying in verse 18. When that person hears the words of this curse, he's going to boast and say, I have peace, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart, in order to destroy the water land with the rock. The Lord will never be willing to forgive them, but rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will burn against that man, and every curse which is written in this book will rest on him. And the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. Oh my gosh. That's, that's like, you know, I got that boldly marked. Because he's really saying something important here. People, they, they, the reason this has happened is what's, ha what's beginning to happen with the children. They're not even in the promised land yet. What happens when they get to the promised land? They do bad things. And numbers. They, like, they sent, they sent the, uh, the the guys in, and they come back, and it's like, Janice, we can't do it. And, blah, blah, blah. and so he says, okay, you're going back, right? Mm -hmm. Because they, they obviously do not understand the blessing versus the curse. This, this, is, this is behavior that people are doing. Then the Lord will single them out for adversity, verse 21, from all the tribes of Israel, according to all the curses of the covenant which are written in this book of the law. Now the generation to come, your sons who rise up after you, and the foreigner who comes from a distant land, when they see the place of the land and the disease which the Lord has afflicted, it will say, all its land is brimstone and salt, a burning waste, unsung, and unproductive. No grass grows in it like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Adma and Zebulun, which the Lord only threw in his anger and in his wrath. Okay, so all the nations will say, why has the Lord done this to this land? Why this great outburst of anger? Well, guess what he's going to say? Hey, Barbara, you need to turn off your video so you're not recording. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. that. Okay, so let me get this. Let me, let me get the view changed here. Uh, yeah. Okay. So what is it, uh, important is that what will the nation say? They're first going to say, wow, why has this happened? And then verse 25, then men will say, they forsook the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they have not known and whom he has not allotted to them. The Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and in fury and in great wrath and cast them into another land, as it is this day. So, verse 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things we build belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe the words of this God. So, basically, 29 is kind of saying there are things that are coming they don't really know about. That's right. Only the Lord knows those things, but what do they know? They know they have disobeyed. They know that God's going to judge them. They know that they deserve it. It is an amazing statement. Now, 30 is really kind of uh, part of all this as well. And uh, I'm just going to, I love chapter 30. It's a good, it's a good study. If you want to live, you've got to choose life. You've got to choose to obey. 30 verse 1. So it shall be when all of these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you today, and you call them to mind in all nations where the Lord your God has banished you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and soul according to all that I command you today, you and your sons, and the Lord your God will restore you from captivity, have compassion on you, gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. So he's going to give you Verses 6 through 10, he says some pretty amazing things. First, he tells you in verse 30, in chapter 30, you must return. But you cannot return. You return by repenting. And then you see uh, 6 through 10 is he's going to do something for you. He's going to circumcise your heart. This is so amazing. This is Deuteronomy. This is not Jeremiah. This is not Isaiah. This is not. This is before they're even in the land. And he's talking about the difference between a physical covenant circumcision and the circumcision of the heart. That is an amazing statement. Because what is he saying? When you're circumcised in your heart, you are able to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul that you may live. Isn't that a definition of salvation? <laughs> now, here's the thing. The law, when we when we study Acts, the law is now on our hearts. That's the Holy Spirit does. He was given on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost means 10. Pentecost is the only feast for all the families of Israel had to go to Jerusalem because that was when the law was read, just like what he's doing right here. And so the law is read, but that morning the the spirit came upon the 120 in the upper room, uh, upper room, and they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. So the law is now written on their hearts. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. I'm going to write my law on your heart. This is the law written on stone. But he is going to then empower them to be able to do it if they obey him. So they've got to make a decision. Just like I, he doesn't save me and then ask me to make a decision to be saved. This is this, this, it's the same thing, Old and New Testament. It doesn't matter. I have to choose and say, Lord, I want to be saved. I want to obey you. I want a new heart. He will empower you to have the heart individually. It's not the Holy Spirit on all of us, but it is because it's the same God. There's nothing, it's not new. 
It's not new. It's just that Jesus fulfilled it, right? So 6 through 10 is a new heart and a blessing. That's what 6 through 10 is about. A new heart and blessing. And then the rest of it pretty much goes right on downhill, doesn't it? If you obey the Lord, if you turn to the Lord with all your heart. And he says, this commandment, which I command you today, you today is not too difficult for you. It is not out of reach. I can't do it. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, oh, yes, you can. It is not in heaven that you should say. Who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? It is not beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea for us to go get it for us and make us hear it that we might observe it? But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. Isn't that an amazing statement? I think, I think that's an incredible statement. And he says, 15, I'm on down. I've set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. Love the Lord your God. Walk in his ways. Keep his commandments and his statutes. Because sacrifice was there to cover them when they failed. So why isn't that? And do we have? Do we fail? Yes. We have the Holy Spirit within us to go back to our hearts and forgive us of our sins. If your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away, I declare to you, you will perish. Yep. Verse 19 and 20, I call heaven and earth to witness against you. Isn't what all this was talking about? Heaven and earth. No rain, no soil, you know, disease. It's, it's what we say. I call heaven and earth to witness against you. I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose, curse. Choose life that you may live. By loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, holding fast to him, for this is your life and the length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. So we see 15 through 20 really is choose. Choose life or death. Incredible. That's an incredible statement right there. Okay. So now yeah, not, I just want this thought oh, option, but choose life or death, not just for me, but for offspring and generations. So yeah, our children. And that's it's why just for me is for that that's why Manasseh is so important to study along with this. That's why we had to go back and see that important statement about it is to all generations, right? It's going to be to all generations, this, this command of the Lord. And we get to Manasseh, Ammon, and Josiah. We're getting to the end. We've only got these three kings and then four more, and we're done. And we're going to see some pretty dumb things happen. Okay. Now, this, so, this part of Deuteronomy is during when God was leading them through. They're still in the wilderness. So they have him with them, though. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go in, Deuter in, in 2 Kings 21. Verses 1 through 18 is the reign of Manasseh. So this is 21. 1 through 18. Manasseh. So what do we learn about Mr. Manasseh? He was the worst. He was 12 years old. 12 years old. And ran for 55 years. That's became, yeah, became king. Because he's a rule. 55 years. Now, there is some there I looked at and I put the notes in there. There are some that believe that the first 12 years uh, uh, he co-ruled with his father. And they're saying, uh, this one guy that I read said that he uh, he believed that Manasseh ruled with his father from 697 until his father's death. 
uh, Demi World of the Silk King. But other historians, and I really am of this camp because I don't understand why it would have been delineated the way it was when we studied Hezekiah. But he also keeps born three years after the miracle uh, of the deliverance, right, of uh, Hezekiah. And And then he died. When, when uh, Hezekiah died, then he took on the rule as well. That's how I think it. But it doesn't really matter, I don't think. I think the only reason that, that there's any interest in that is because of how he began to rule. It's like uh, he had to have, if, if, if he, uh, either way, if he happened, because Manasseh didn't rule that much longer, that he had only 15 more years to rule. So I just can't see how he was able to rule them before that. Does it make sense to me? You know, he'd have to be, he'd have to rule for only three years, is what I'm saying. If that happened, it would only be for three years. Okay. So maybe that's possible. So anyway, what did he do? Hey, the big guy. Yeah. Is it legal in the sign of the Lord? How do he do it? He rebuilt all the high places. All the things his dad place. tore down. All the pagan uh, icons, I say it, Hezekiah destroyed. He, he rebuilt it. He was a busy guy. And he put altars in the, in the temple. Really, really insulting to the Lord. What else did he do? Sacrificed his son. Made his son as through the fire. So, um, yeah. Sacrifice his own son. Well, the other thing, too, that's so interesting about him is that uh, he. He practiced, he sacrificed his son, but the practice, the things, witchcraft, divination, meaning, spiritists, carved images. And the thing that I thought was so important about what it said here, it said he seduced, mm -hmm. he seduced Judah to do evil. And how did God feel about what he did? What did God say about this, putting this altar? And bringing such calamity on Jerusalem and Judah that whoever hears it, both his ears will tingle. And why did he say that? Because he talks about it here. He said, he made this, he did much evil in the cycle of the motion of his anger. He set the Asherah in the house of the Lord. And in this house, and in verse 7, in Jerusalem, which I have chosen for all the tribes of Israel, I will put my hand in front of them. So God will bring calamity to Manasseh. Because of this sin because of this uh, putting the altar. Uh, 
I mean, it was the height of it. That was a, that was what delivered his father and delivered Judah from being taken captive. It's when Hezekiah did that, and he just went right up there and wiped out that whole thing. Then verse 10 tells us what? The Lord spoke through his servants, the prophets. There was more than one prophet, but I believe that Isaiah was still living. There, the tradition is that, that Manasseh saw him in half, killed him. Um, but I think Isaiah was probably still around, and there would be a few others still talking and saying, what are you doing? Then we see uh, verse 13. I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab, and I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it, turning it upside down. What a picture that is. <laughs> Man, that's, uh, that's sobering right there. And he says, in verse 12, make sure I'm in the right one, yeah. Verse 12, he says, I am going to judge it, right? It's going to be more of a judgment than anyone has ever seen. That's It's going to be bad. And then going back to Deuteronomy, was he promising? And so he says, um, more than any other king in the land, he's going to judge. I will abandon the remnant of my inheritance and deliver them into the hands of the enemy. He is going to abandon. He's going to do that. That's, that's pretty sober. They have been provoking how long? Verse 15. Have been provoking me to anger since the day their fathers came from Egypt, even to this day. So God is telling them all the way back here, I'm going to bless you, and if you disobey, I'm going to curse you. And he was the worst one. He seduced them to, to evil. He was the worst king that they had had up to this point. That is saying a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Just wonder what happened. I mean, his dad wasn't too bright at the end, but I mean, he had served God. What is the last thing that he said? I, I, I always think about this. When Isaiah came to him and said, What have you done? Yeah. You have shown at least, your um, yeah. at least it'll be peaceful until I'm gone. It'd be peaceful, peace in the land. Yeah. So I, I think at that point, when Isaiah came to him and said that, the hand had already turned. You know, things had already turned. Because I don't think he was worshiping false gods or doing anything like that. But the judgment, because this is. To the generations. He wasn't concerned about who followed. He wasn't concerned about it. And maybe his son was little and was getting some influences. He still was like his son. Mm -hmm. You know, what was he allowing to have happen? Just saying. So, verse 16 says, He shed very much innocent blood until it filled Jerusalem from one into the other. Besides the sin that which he made you to sin. That is a lot. He shed much innocent. Remember in Revelation, the cup that Mr. Babylon drinks is the blood of all the martyr, all the people who have died since Genesis, since I mean, that cup. When you think about the innocent blood, the people who've been deceived because of the sin, that is, an, that is a very harsh thing to say. He gets buried where? 
garden of his own house. I'm sure it was very quiet. I don't think it would be a big deal. Well, all I can say is thank God for uh, Second Chronicles 33. <laughs> I, mean, I gotta tell you, uh, that's, that's, uh, thank goodness. So he did evil. He rebuilt the high places, made his sons. They say more than one, but I think it was probably just one. Uh, a fellow Benhanon and all the things that he did. And then verse 8 of 2 Chronicles 33 says, I will, I will not again, says, hold on, in this house in Jerusalem, which I've chosen from all the tribes of Israel, I'll put my name forever, and I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I have returned for your fathers. If only you will have observe all that to do all that I've commanded them according to the law. So he's saying, I wouldn't remove you if you just obey. <laughs> Thus Manasseh misled Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations of the Lord destroyed before the sons of Israel. I mean, that is uh, so great. Manasseh did more evil than the wicked nations. Around him. That is, uh, wow, sobering. And so what, what did uh, uh, verse 10 tell us? That God spoke to him and his people and they didn't pay attention. And he ignored it. So what's the result? He gets captured. With hooks? Yes. <laughs> God sent. I looked up the name of the king. It was uh, it was not uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. It was uh, one, a couple of kings before him. And uh, he was over Babylon. This is before the Babylonians got the city of Babylon. And how did he drag him out? Hooks. Yep. Bronze chains. With a ring in his nose, like a like a, a bull. bull. Hooks and chains. Let me tell you, that's saying something. He must have been, I mean, even in Babylon, they knew about this guy. That's what it's saying. And what happens to him there? He repented. Yes. There, this is uh, in distress. He cried out. And what did he learn? What did he see? He humbled himself. He prayed. He was moved. God was moved by his prayer and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. He, in distress, he cried out to God. He humbled himself.
God delivered him. Brought him home. There's so much about this that I think is so uh, amazing. Because 14 through 17 is a reformed king. He's really trying to do the right thing. 14 through 17 is amazing. But I, I just want us to kind of make a little note here. What are some things we see about God? Just up to this point. Well, God will save the worst of sinners if you repent. Repent. Always ready to forgive. He's always ready to forgive. He makes it clear what he requires. For forgiveness. He makes it clear. It's not a mystery. It's not a secret code you got to do to figure out how God's going to deliver you. He always makes it clear. And he's always ready. And what's another thing? It does not matter how bad you sin was. What we have done is not the factor for forgiveness. What we have done is not the factor. It's whether or not we repent of it. I just think that we it would do us well to remember that. Because there's some pretty bad people out there and done some pretty horrific things. But if they truly get on their knees and ask God for repentance, he forgives them. Mm -hmm. um, it makes me wonder why they keep following the bad. And you know, there's that saying, you know, it's biblical that bad company corrupts good every time. That's what it is. And but I still wonder how could they keep doing the bad, bad stuff? When they know that God is there, they know that God will forgive them, and they know that God has the answer. I think that's such a great question. I want us to really think about that question a second. I want us to really think about that. Um, because I, I, I believe that um, we're going to talk about Ammon, who was, I can't even imagine the, the disappointment that Manasseh must have felt about that, right? Yeah, I... I found a comment while reading about him and it said, a son found the father's bad example easier to follow than the good one. Is it just because that's all he knew? Well, let's think about, we don't know, you know, at, he was 22 when he became king. Mm -hmm. So for 22 years, or let's say, let's say, let's say for 10 years, we'll just mm -hmm. say for 10 or 15 years, I don't know how long it was, we don't know what the time frame is. Because he did some good things, like he, uh, Manasseh was rebuilding the wall, he was bringing protection, he was, he was behaving like a good king. Uh, and um, it's, it's interesting to note, I, I think that maybe his son was a, had been a teenager when this happened. Mm -hmm. I don't think that Manasseh was gone that long. I think the guy was pretty dang hedonistic before. And it wouldn't take much to get his attention because I just, you know, this is one of the great things for me about the fact that I'm in prison with women and I hear their side of things after they're in prison. And um, yeah, I mean, they spend a lot of time uh, remembering the dumb things they did and feeling really bad about it. I mean, that's part of the benefit of being in prison. And I would suspect that he's been there hanged, you know, hung on to chains, hooking his nose, being treated like an animal. 
that he, he pronounces like, I am with him. And, you know, I don't know if God will forgive me. But if he will forgive me, and God did do that, gave him peace in his heart because then he's released and he goes right back to doing the right thing. You think he was loud about it? I bet he was. I think it was obvious that he was changed. That he was a man who believed he, he knew that the Lord was God, or God was the Lord. He knew it. That's an amazing statement. And the thing is, is that um, his son was probably participating. He knows that his son was participating in the sacrifice of his brothers. See, I, I think that there are some wounds that we, we, we kind of, how do I say this? Sometimes I think we jump over the, the bad things that have happened to people to get them saved without recognizing some of the damage that that has caused. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we expect our children, because I'll have inmates say, well, I just don't know why my child, I've been talking about Jesus and she just won't believe in me. And I'm like, well, you know, how old was your child? How long were you drinking? How long were you doing drugs? How long were you prostitute? Whatever it was. How old were they when you were doing that? How old were they when you were doing that? So one of the things that this really spoke to me is something that I think is important to really think about. We all have children who are not where we want them to be. All right? Whether we were good parents or not, I mean, I'm going to actually teach on this side in, in April, uh, Streams in the Desert kind of thing. Um, whether we were good parents or not, you got to go back to Deuteronomy and say, God clearly states what he expects. And every person has to make a choice. And the thing is, is that the choices that we make, sure, sometimes they are based in, uh, my parents were, were, were religious freaks. I don't want to be like that. It would be that kind of thing too, right? But the truth is, is that God has given them opportunity, those bad things that are going on, God's opportunity for the kids. They just have to cry. And we just can't be guilty about it. And NASA, I'm sure, felt horribly guilty as a parent for what he taught his son, for the things that he did, because he was such a good king at the end of the day. And you don't hear any complaint about him being buried outside of the kings at his own house, because that was not done, unless you were very wicked. You never see a comment about that. And the other thing that he did, which I was so impressed about when I read that, it says, verse 18, the rest of the acts, his prayer to God, the words of the seers, all these things, everything that he did. Verse 19, how God entreated him and all his sin, his unfaithfulness, the sites he built, all of this stuff, and before he humbled himself, they're written in the records. So he didn't just say all the good things. He didn't, he didn't, he did not ignore the sin. He wrote it down and said, I did this, 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 and this, and God judged me and took me to prison and I delivered, and now I'm humbled, and the Lord has delivered me. And I think that is an amazing statement about this God. Um, we do not take people to this verse and these verses. I kind of think sometimes mm -hmm. we should. We should take somebody and say, did you burn your brother in the fire? So, or your son? Did you sacrifice your child? Did you do any of these things? Did you shed a lot of blood? I've got people in prison have. Mm -hmm. But that person needs to know that God forgave doesn't mean their life is going to come back to some perfect stand, but it does mean God forgave. But he was king. He could have had all the bad stuff expunged. Say, so don't write that down about me. I just want to you know the good stuff about right. me. Right. But he left himself to be that example. Isn't that amazing? 
So he, his, his, um, what's where we here? His legacy, the legacy of Manasseh was truth about his sin and truth about God's love. That's what he left. There were consequences to the wrong things that he did. Because his son was damaged by that. But he was forgiven for that. And each one of us individually, when your children are young and they're not, they're not, they don't have any control over their circumstances, and you get saved, thankfully I got saved when children were really young. Mm -hmm. Really young. Thank you, Jesus. But the reality is, is that I still did things that were, that discouraged them, that disillusioned them, that wasn't the right thing. But if we live our life do checking ourselves like that, we're not living in the power of who God is in our life, how he has delivered us. And if he can deliver me, he can deliver my child. We just got to get ourselves in the right understanding. Ask God to really speak to you about this, because I think this is a very comforting thing as parents. For us to recognize this man had a dramatic change and it was an obvious change and the whole nation knew about it but it doesn't mean that they're going to get saved simply because they know and I think even for this country we cannot put our hope in one man we nope. can only put our hope in them amen right True. So what did you say? Just because they know say say that they are not saved or forgiven just because they know? Well, the children of Manasseh's son, he knew what his dad did. He has to give his whole heart to him. His dad's salvation cannot save the sin. It's his choice. It's it is so knowing choice. knowing about yep. Jesus. Knowing about him is not. There has to be an action that accompanies it. What we say when we talk about our kids growing up in a good home is that they got the information you needed. You were the Moses, if you will, declaring the Ten Commandments, right? The foundation. But they still had to choose to obey it. We can't we can't spend our time agonizing over what we could have done, or should have done, or would have done, right? It gets you nowhere. It's Don't you hate it when you hear about people who've been, you know, they start, they think they need to go to therapy, and, and I realize that that's a very big part of some people's, they need to. But a lot of times the therapist always just tries to go back to the parents or to the mother. And yeah. I hate that when, yes, there's probably some things that happen that made them think the way they do, but they have to make their choice. Well, you know. Are you going to live in that prison? Exactly. Right. You still have to make a choice. I think that. The past lonely prisoner. I have, I mean, I have a friend who's got some serious mental health issues. Sure. Because of the way she was raised. So, but she's a believer. And it took her a long time to forget, but she did forget. Mm -hmm. And uh, she has a lot more peace. She still has some mental health issues, but because certain damages, you know, are not going to be healed to you. It doesn't make it go away. It doesn't yeah. make it go away. But the difference is that, you know, um, I think I could say that in my own life. I was able to uh, forgive my mother and do the things that I needed to do for her uh, because the Lord was in my I, I just think that that's the key. We want to be the example of Christ. We are not Christ. We're only an example. He is the one who saves. We can um, we can say, you know, man, you're making a mistake, and I, I'm grieving for you, and let me tell you about my life and what happened and why I'm telling you it's bad. But the reality is, is that they have to make the choice. And all we can really do is pray for them. That they have a Manasseh one. Wherever they are, that it's not so bad that it kills them, but it's bad enough that they have to cry out. 
And I tell people in the prison all the time, you're here because God loves you and he wants you to make a choice. And sometimes, sometimes they don't make the right choice and they have to come back. God, in the dark. All right. So, reminds me of the saying, you know, how low do you have to go? Yeah. 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 How low? Before we ask God to do it. And mean it. Yeah, that's a big thing. All right. That's one of the things that kind of, you know, for as bad as Manasseh was, you know, God knew what it took to get him to come to it. Right. But how do you know, you know, as, as humans that they really meant what they said? You know, People will ask for forgiveness or whatever, but as soon as, as soon as things are, they go back to what they. But know. he didn't do that. Manasseh didn't yeah. do that. So it's in the it's in the behavior. It's in the behavior. Uh, and I think it, as people and as parents, we tend to, and we see something going on in a family member's life. Our um, Nature is to rescue and not let mm -hmm. go through. Yeah, yeah. We can sometimes see where this is going, how it will be. Is it our job just to let it happen? It uh, so we can't rescue? stop it. I can't rescue. <sighs> Only God has that. Sometimes I find myself just praying that that things don't happen that cause per permanent damage. Yes. Before they find it. That's totally look. Listen, let me tell you, I, I'm with you there. I don't want to see them die or be maimed or you know, whatever. But the thing is, is that are we willing to allow God to do his best care? And I think there are times when, yes, we should intervene. There's times when I have intervened and it's been the right thing. And there's times when I've intervened, it's been the wrong thing. And I've just encouraged it to go for My daughter, my yes. youngest daughter. I, yes. You know, you try to help, you try to advise, you try to do all these things. And over the last couple of years, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit is going to do a mighty work in your life. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, because I don't know what's going to turn out. We have to be a peace. We have to, you know, we have to come to a place of peace about yes. that. That, that. That's the thing. And that's one of the great things about this study that I'm so blessed by because, you know, it's going to go downhill from here. This is just lesson one. It's going to, yeah. you know, it's taking the notes dive. You know, it's got a little bit of Josiah, but oh, then after that, like it's, this. you know, probably a little bit. Sort of like down the train. Yeah. Down the train. So, so here we go to now Ammon, verse 21 to 25. And, you know, they just, so. Um, it didn't last long. 22 years <laughs> old, became king, reigned two years, and was killed by his people. Dang Ola. <laughs> uh, and the thing that's so interesting is that he did evil in the sight of the Lord as Manasseh, his father, had done. Ah, I read something that said that talking about the length of their reign is that because Manasseh humbled himself, his reign was extended. Yeah, I believe. And that. because Amon did not humble himself, his reign was cut short. Well, let's, let's think about that. It wasn't just that he reigned two years, but his own people killed him. Mm -hmm. Inspired amongst him. That's right. His servants conspired against him and put him to death in his own house. Now, yeah. 
I just want to point out something here. I think there's something really powerful about what that's saying. Um, because I I think what what do you think God would go ahead? Why would not why would God not allow his rule to extend? Anyone in trouble? Yeah. That? Why do you only let him go two years? So he can do any more damage. That's it. No, because it, because was it was so, so corrupt. It was so corrupt. He was going to actually probably eclipse the behavior of his father. Because just in two years, his own servants are like, we can't take this. we got to take him out. Well, you, know, you, said, you just come off of this rank of Manasseh who had repented and life was good again. Right. And now we're taking you down this path again. There we go, as we see today in our own country. Yeah. Yes. Crazy pants stuff, isn't it? Yes, it is. So, killed by servants, he would have been more wicked than Manasseh. And so what happens then? The people... So the servants killed them, but the people, this is the people out there, killed the servants. Why? Why did they kill them? They were happy back in their sin again. I think it's because only God can take them out. Take him out. Okay. I think so he didn't, so you don't think that that... I think that God would have taken him out his way. Okay. So God... How did God deal with Manasseh? He took them to captivity and gave them time to repent. Yeah. Ammon started up, and within two years, he was, he was eclipsing his father. And the people were like, the, the servants were like, we can't do this. So they intervened in God's place. Okay. God might have sent the Assyrian guy back to him, and then he would have been delivered. You know, we don't know. We don't know because there was no opportunity in there to be saved. And, and so the people did not remember the words of Manasseh about repentance. That's exactly what you guys are saying. you got to let them go and pray that they don't get harmed until they repent. Because if we intervene, we could be killing God's opportunity. But they weren't. They weren't seeking God. They weren't seeking God. They were concerned about this. And I, I thought about that. I thought, what relief they must have felt when they killed him. Yeah. And he's gone. We don't have to worry about it. Right. But the thought of what God might have done never entered their mind. Exactly. Exactly. That's why, why we have to think about things this way. Because we have such an incredible, you know, I, it makes me sad that that people don't study the kings in, in this is such a powerful study. I mean, the whole thing you really go back and you start in the back of your book, you have the little draw out chart that mm -hmm. tells the story. Mm -hmm. Try to do it. You, you're going to be surprised at what you remember and, and how important it is and how uh, New Testament it is. You know, that God's got to be the one to get in there and intervene. We can, we can pray. We can walk a righteous walk. We can give them the tools. We can give them the word. We can do all those things for them. We can't save them. We cannot set up the perfect scenario for them to bow the knee. We can't do any of those things. But when those things happen, and it's going to happen if a person is really out of control, God is going to get a hold of them and give them an opportunity for repent. We need to be there with the right heart attitude about what we are going to do or say. I'm not your judge. God is your judge. But I am the voice of the Lord to you, if you will listen. Bring him to the scripture and say, listen, people people who aren't saved say, oh, I'm not that bad. Don't say that. At least I'm not murdering people. Do you think it in your heart? Who's want to kill this week? Who's want to kill this week? That's <laughs> So, my sister will say some people just need killing. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's all that about anger, apparently. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We need to do it. People just 
<laughs> so the people put Josiah on the throne, he was eight years old. Why did the people of the land do this? Why do you think they did it? Their choice. Pleasing in the Lord's side. I mean, they must have known that he was doing what the Lord wanted. Desperation. Yeah. Desperation. I, I just can't imagine how bad it must have been. Eight years old. And he's a he's great king. He's a good king. But not right away. Takes a little time. But he found the wall. How fascinating is that? And I wonder if the story from NASA is in there. And he read it. You know? Probably because the NASA didn't blot it out. All the all the bad. Emma was buried in the same, the, the, they say that Emma was buried in the same garden as his dad, as had, at his dad's house. So that was, that would be Emma, maybe they buried him right next to the nest. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the thing that's so sad about that is that uh, you never want to see your children do things like that. You don't want to be worse than you. I'm sure Manasseh would bang his son. Please, yeah. Listen to me. Listen to me. But the only way that we really know that God is in charge and he's moving and doing the things that he's doing is when we take the time to listen to him and quit listening to other outside forces. You know, um, be in the word. And pray and ask God to really show me. So I'm wondering, he's eight years old. Who was raising him? Well, we were looking at that. <laughs> Somebody was raising him. Sure. Now, one of the things that is important, and I couldn't find it, and I'm going to keep researching, they always list the mother. Yeah, and the mother's name means something, and I could not find the meaning of her name. Of any demons or uh, uh, any of the mothers, of, uh, yeah. And I can't remember. I looked and looked, and I couldn't find the name. Something on uh, Hepzibah. Hepzibah. Yes. It's believed that she. There is some reference by somebody that thinks that her father could have been Isaiah. Um, the mother of your son. Is that? Yeah. yeah, I really looked for it and I couldn't find it. And I and I've got some can some good uh, hips about it. Yeah, I don't know if if she if she was whose mother? Manasseh's mother. Was it? I could have been her father. Could have been Isaiah, her or father. he could have been a grandfather. It, okay, it was unclear. Well, Isaiah lived. During the reign of Manasseh, he died during the reign. Of yes. Manasseh. So maybe I don't know, but uh, I, I I'm gonna have to do more research on that because I, I want to find I want to find the names, and that's a good thing if you can find those names, it'll 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 tell you about them all. It'll definitely tell you what the household is. Okay. Well, is there anything else we want to say about this? This lesson? No. Well, to bring it to bring it forefront, I was reading some information and it said that uh, a leader with political priorities and not spiritual will lead his people astray. Right. And I thought how how fitting that is for our country today. It is. It's very fitting. And we are going to be in Zephaniah. Day of the Lord and all that and part and lesson too. So be ready for that. Um I, I I do think it's very hard. Very hard. And and I I I have really worked hard uh, to get this done. I'm so look at it. So and I'm not gonna be having class on the first.
April 1st. We'll be coming back from Louisiana for Easter. Oh, you said that. So yeah. we'll be here on the first. I'll give you I think I have two weeks for the work that you get. So it didn't make any difference this last time. I was doing it last night after I got home from Maria. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. We were I was at church every day. I was at church every day last week. Yeah. And it's a busy time. So, you know, I understand. I mean, we're going to be finished the first week of May, I think. So it's not like, you know, it's going to be. Is Deuteronomy supposed to be in here? Yeah. It's not in the internet. Oh, oh he, you're going he, over all that. No, all I, that, that I, that I didn't miss a whole book. I didn't miss a whole book. Yeah, <laughs> the Deuteronomy's not in here at all. It goes yeah. first. Of, that's why I was thinking I was had the wrong book. Well, the in and out. Sometimes there are things that are in there, but usually it's not the entire book. And we'll get a reference. But the, I look back. There's no reference. So it, it, uh, it, you have to go to the whole chapter. So it talks about yeah, 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 yeah. everything is, yeah. is in there. You know, but on seventh year, we're supposed to read the entirety uh, uh, yeah. of the. Uh, yeah, we didn't even talk about that. Yeah. Like, there's so much in there. There's so much in there, you know. That's right. Okay. Well, let's like pray. Right. Where, where's Kay? Is she? She's at Dr. Women. Okay. Oh, she's back from Honduras. Oh, yeah. No. She's, she's back. Oh, then she's back. Okay. Okay. I don't know if she's back from there or not. She sent pictures of her. Okay. My, my face would be shut down, so I can't. Yeah. Of, of her mission trip. Oh, I was on her time. I really want to hear about her trip. Yeah. yeah. She'll give her some time to tell me. She so, back. She you know, book. April 8th is the day that they're supposed to have the. Uh, the full eclipse, oh, yeah, and, everything. The eclipse and that is a Monday, isn't okay. it? Okay, well, we should be out before the eclipse, right? It's at noon, isn't it? Well, we're not going to see much of it here. Yeah, yeah, we are. Right. We're supposed to be in the full eclipse. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah. Well, do y'all want it to? I mean, I think it's going to be a madhouse. Oh, I think the traffic's going to be okay, a well, we can nightmare. Just, so we'll just skip the eight. We did buy our glasses. We did yeah, buy the last half a six for $10. Yeah, okay. we, need, we bought them last year. I think it's fine. Okay, well, let's okay. pray. Let's get yeah. this price so we can. So, Father, just thank you so much for this study of the Mass. Oh, Lord, I uh, look forward to meeting him. I believe he's in heaven with you. And uh, I just thank you, Father, that the, the, the hope is, is that you do save sinners. You save very, very wicked people. And Lord, I just ask you to help us to have a heart attitude that really represents your character and your love for your lost children. We all have lost children in our families or children who are on the wrong path or children who are um, kind of teetering on the edge. Uh, whatever the circumstance, Father, we know that you do love our children because you love us. I was somebody's child and you saved me. So I know, Lord, that you will save we just ask you, Father, we lift up our families to you and ask you, Lord, to help us be the, the right kind of light. Use us in whatever way you see fit, Lord, so that your voice would go forth and that your people, your children, our children, would be saved. I thank you for the children that are saved. Help them to learn how to be a light. And help us, Father, to have a heart attitude that is always looking for you in every circumstance. I praise you and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> no, I'm sorry. I didn't know